morning. Oh, what a beautiful day this is going to be. I got the weather report last week and I was ecstatic. Couldn't wait till today. It's going to be great. If perchance you're visiting, we would like for you to fill out a visitor's card you'll find in the pew in front of you. And that'll be That'll take care of that. That will be your contribution today. Has several announcements for you. Kind of review your bulletin. Dole Drennan back, still in the hospital. And uh, I wonder if they took care of his fluid buildup situation. I'm sure they probably did. Uh, Rick Mobley, the husband of Sheila Milliken's. Niece is in the Little Rock Hospital, still there. Is he home now? How's he doing? Good as can be expected. Dalton Phillips is at the Southside Clinic. He has COVID symptoms, so they're checking uh, check him, ha- uh, him out to be sure that uh, he's okay. I think he said COVID before, which is kind of unusual to say, but it could be helpful. Others we need to remember. Where is she? There she is. She's in her wheelchair back there. Do you all know that Bonita Bangs is back? Yes, she is. There she is. Uh, others, and we're going to include... And keep Bonita in our prayers, of course. She gets her full strength back. Victoria Covington also on that list. Diana Hudson and Melvin and Joy Hudson. And Lou Massey. And uh, Kaylee Miller. And of course Dalton that we mentioned. And Jim Phillips. And Terry Rutherford. Jennifer Sexton. Patsy Thomas. All on our prayer list. And the family of Conda Platt as well, who passed away on Thursday. They've had her funeral services. They were at uh, Crouch Funeral Home in Batesville. Burial was at Egner Cemetery at Salado. You may remember when Conda could uh, come to church here. That was... Uh, as Bill mentioned, or I believe this morning as Reva's niece. Uh, she was she was blessed, I think we all would say, in a way. Conda had a heart transplant at the age of 60. And uh, I believe you were telling me this morning about five years is what one would be given if that transplant is successful and she lived she lived 11 years and so let's remember Conda Conda's family in our prayers we're going to have a collection for refugees Today and also next Sunday to send to the Levy congregation to help with the Romanian churches in their effort to help the refugees of Ukraine. It is my belief and I think the belief of many that this is not a time for neutrality in our world. Neutrality benefits the aggressor and does not benefit the victim. And the way that we can move from neutrality is to help with the Romanian church's efforts. Gospel meeting coming up. You may have gotten a sheet on it this morning. It'll be April 1st through the 3rd. Guest speaker, Ben Bailey. Ben is from Alabama, Plainview Church Christ in Hazel Green, Alabama. 
He's a speaker for the Gospel of Christ television, radio, and internet broadcast. A lot of experience. Friday at 7 p.m., Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday, Bible classes at 9, worship at 10, Sunday afternoon, worship at 1 p.m. There will be a potluck available to all. Hope all will come to be Sunday after the worship. If you have any other questions about it, Bill will be happy to visit with you about it. But that, that's coming up now, very soon, on April 1st through the 3rd. Be a work day for all men coming up this next Saturday, March 26th. Gets underway at 8 in the morning. You're urged to come to help to get our building and grounds ready for that meeting that I just told you about. Children's home shopping list is for cleaning supplies. No spray cans, they say, please. Non aerosol. And a banquet for seniors and teacher appreciation banquet for our teachers and members who are 50 years of age or older. As I mentioned to you last week, I'm glad I finally got to that group there so I get that good meal. Food will be provided and will be served by the elders. The sign up sheet in the foyer. They really want you to sign up now. As I say sign up, they just. Jot your name down so they know you'll be there because when it comes to putting food together, it's good to have a number. Have a card here with me. I'll take a look at it with you. Nice looking card. It says, nice things just seem to bloom from you. Thanks so much for your calls and your prayers and all that you do we love you all jim and benita banks is there anything i may have missed i gotta tell you you're right i gotta get off this stage because uh, this next guy coming up he just makes me feel undressed he's got it going i'm telling you i love it he looks great Philadelphia law, lawyer. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I heard trumpets sounding. And went outside. Thought it might be the last day, and it was Steve's and Chris's car blaring. So, <laughs> did want to mention about the the uh, the donations that were going to be sent into the Levy congregation. If you do write a check, you might want to just put in the memo refugees, and that way we'll know that that's what that's for. Um, but again, that hopefully that is a good work that they're doing over there. A lot of, a lot of things going on over there, as you know. Four ninety nine is what our first song will be. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. I for Thank you. 
most gracious and kind of heavenly father we come to thee today father father we need you so much today father in our lives father we just ask that you be with this congregation here today father as we gather to worship we're just so thankful for the freedom that you give us to together here and worship your name and and not feel a threat from our government father father we just ask that you be with the people that's the refugees that's that's left that country over there and father just be with the ones their fathers and their and their brothers that stayed behind to fight for freedom for their country, Father. We just ask that you bless them as they as they defend and bless the refugees as they come out and just protect them and guide them and keep them safe, Father. Father, we uh, also have several sick in our congregation, Father. We just ask that you uh, continue to bless our sick, Father, especially Dalton Phillips as he uh, deals with this COVID. Father, we just ask that you heal him and just give him his strength back that he needs, Father. Just just give him the, give him the, give him the things he needs, Father, to uh, to overcome this illness that he has, Father. Father, we ask that you be with Conda Platt's family, Father, as they deal with the loss of, of their loved one, Father. Just deal with them as they deal with the loss and the greed, and just give them the comfort they need during this time, Father. We also ask that you be with the, be with the ones that 
that uh, puts herself in arm way in our country here to defend us, who are our soldiers, our EMTs, our police officers, father, our firemen, are all it, it puts herself out there because they feel it's their job to defend our our place here as keep our freedom and keep us safe, Father. Father, we ask that you also go as, as go into this service, Father, be with Brother Bills. He brings our message and he gives him the knowledge and the words he needs to teach, Father. Just guide us and direct us in all things we do. Most of all, Lord, forgive us of our sins. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Three hundred thirty. On this song, we take the Lord's Supper. On this Lord's day, we assemble round the table of the Lord. At the hours are made to tremble. When we hear his blessed word, thanks to God for such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for this exalted favor, that's memorial of his love. We recall his broken body as we look upon this friend. This was instituted by our Savior himself. And let us be mindful of the price that he did pay that we might have life everlasting. Well, that's Robert to offer the blessing for the yeah. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and for the opportunity we have to surround your table. Father, we give you thanks for your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who freely gave his life upon the cross that we may have forgiveness of our sins. Father, we pray that you would bless this loaf, which to us as Christians represents his broken body. Father, we pray that you would bless this loaf and bless the ones that partake of it. Forgive us where we fail you. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
pray. Our Father in heaven, we continue our thanks to you for this, the fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians so fittingly represents the blood of our Lord and Savior as he hung there on that cruel cross. Pray, Father, that you would be with us as we partake. <clears throat> and this is our prayer. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> It concludes the Lord's Supper. We we'll take this time now and the convenience of it to return some of the material blessings that we've been blessed with. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity we have together here today. Study your word, to sing your songs, praise, and offer up our prayers. This time, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we had to return some of the material blessings that we've been blessed with. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give us direction in these. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Four thirty three. Number four thirty three. Jesus as the Uh -huh.
like to follow along this morning with the scripture reading you can turn your bibles to first thessalonians chapter 5 verses 14 through 22 and we find here paul is giving instructions on how to treat each other during our times of weakness and these particular scriptures here are mainly directed towards the elders but i believe it is good teaching and instruction for all of us we urge you brethren admonish the unruly Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Huh? 
Well, it's good to have everyone here today. We have uh, the Cup family back home, and we're glad to see them. And they have some of the Moore family with with them, all, all three of them, I think. So the grandkids, and so it's good to good to see all all of them. And good to have Bonita back. And I looked uh, looked down and saw a hat, and looked down further, and it was her. Under that hat, and, and it's been really, it's really great to see you, Benita. Good to have you. Good to have you back. We are encouraged by that. And so I want us today to to think about one another. Uh, just a note on on Dalton. He does not have confirmed COVID. He has COVID symptoms. Uh, Chester. You know, we're talking about remembering things, forgetting things. When we first told Chester to pray for him, I said, uh, gave him a post-it note and a pen. He said, I don't need that. And we kept talking about how we need to write things, or how I have to write things down. And somebody else said, yeah, I've got to write them down too. I think that was Chris. And uh, so Chester said, well, I'll write it down. And he did in his hand. But I don't guess he put all of it down. But he, he got it right. Pray for Dalton and uh, that uh, he does not have... COVID at this time, at least confirmed unless it just happened a few minutes ago. I took the opportunity to, to text a few that I missed this morning uh, when I had a chance. And so uh, I texted Julia and she said, well, we're down at Southside Clinic right now. That's how come, come I, I knew where she was. And I looked around and say Bobby and, and uh, Donna here. And so I texted them between class and, and church. And it really worked because I came out here and they were standing right back there. So I thought, man, that, that really worked. Worked really fast. And I and uh, <clears throat> you, Leah is here, usually here for class. I missed her. And you almost got a text. But anyway, <laughs> we're glad that everybody's here. I think we need to kind of keep up with people. Lest you text uh, Barbara over here. Uh, she is in Mountain Home. Uh, I think they had a... A bridal shire for her granddaughter that lives up there this weekend and some of you might know that from Facebook they had her picture with her granddaughter on Facebook but she is in Mountain Home and either coming back late this afternoon or uh, tomorrow uh, she didn't know really know what it was a couple of other things to note uh, and I got it written down so I'll remember everything but a couple of other things to note is uh, if you did not receive a report from the elders, either by email or by post, uh, there are some copies available on the table in the back. And please get one of those. If you have not received a new director yet, there's extras back there. And we will have extras, probably no more than two per family if you need two, because we had... Uh, a hundred printed last time, and we had a little about half left over. We had a hundred and ten printed this time, just how it ran. And uh, but anyway, if you uh, again get the directory, I thank uh, Hannah a lot for uh, helping put that together, and Inez uh, helped check the names. In fact, she helped uh, in some other ways too, and uh, I appreciate that. And of course, I. I worked on it too, but I got it where it was easier to, to format. I, I learned a lot of things down at Truth for the Day, and one was how to format a book. And uh, the previous directory, this won't mean something to most of you, so I'll hurry up. The previous directory was done in Word, and it was a nightmare to work with, but Microsoft has something called Publisher now, and that's how the directory is done. So, you know, when we have to make changes and things like that, it's a whole lot easier. But anyway, get a directory. Appreciate all the work that was done on that. Sign up. I got that down here too. Sign up for the Senior Appreciation Banquet and for the Teacher uh, ba uh, 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 Senior Banquet and the Teacher's Appreciation Banquet. Sign up for that. Uh, we can have a great time. We can have a great number here. Uh, I mean, if you look around you, everywhere you go, life is returning to whatever it was before COVID hit. There's still people wearing masks. There's still 
doing things. If you feel like you need to wear one, that's fine. You just can't eat with it on. But if you feel like you need to wear one when you're there, you can. But I want to encourage you to come back and to be part of that thing. We have visitors here this morning, and we're glad that they're here. And also, uh, she texted me, but H and Deb Wilson that have been coming regularly on Sunday morning, they are in uh, at Possum Grape today. Uh, some of you might know that H's brother, or Homer's brother, uh, he put down H on the attendance card, and H's brother, Craig Wilson preaches at Possum Grape now. He used to preach at Oil Trough and in Thida, but anyway, they're I guess they're visiting a brother uh, this morning, and so that's where they were. But they wanted us to know. One sad note that I want to begin with is that I want you, if you will, to remember uh, the Arnold family, the Arnold family. Eddie and Betty Arnold, and their daughter, Sharla, who is now Sharla Foster. She married a Batesville boy, um, or really, I think, a Charlotte boy. Uh, lived in Corning when Inez and I lived there. In fact, they remained in Corning for a while until Sharla got married, and then they kind of followed her, her around a little bit. But uh, Betty passed away. And she'd had several strokes in the last... 10 or 11 years, and that led to uh, vascular dementia where uh, she had all the trappings of that, and uh, she passed away uh, about 2 o'clock this morning, and I'll be going, Inez and I will be going back to Corning to, I'll be doing her funeral on Tuesday, but pray for, for Eddie Arnold. Now, Eddie was here, they visited a few times here, Eddie actually spoke, I think, on a Sunday night a few years ago and so anyway pray for eddie not the singer over in tennessee but eddie arnold uh they live outside of batesville now and so continue to pray for him christians should live certain ways but how should christians live how should christians live and Chris read and did a very good job on reading the scriptures. And when you look at it, uh, it does appear, or what he does, uh, talk about uh, elders in verses uh, 12. And he's talking about our responsibility to elders, those that labor among us. I don't know if preachers could be in that too, but in Patrick, uh, well, and preachers can't be unless they're an elder because he says, over you in the Lord context, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, be at peace among yourselves. Now, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to tell you that it is very important that, number one, that we recognize those who labor among you. We need to give a more recognition to elders and elders that serve well. I believe they too are worthy of double honor. And I think that's important as we understand that. Recognize those, according to the New King James, who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Uh, a lot of times in our modern day setting, we don't see elders admonished near enough. Now we have three elders that can preach and they do admonish in their sermons and in their lessons and in other words uh, when it's needed. But elders need to be at the forefront sometime of the admonishing of the brethren. And admonishing doesn't mean necessarily always trying to correct when there's wrong, but to admonish them. And then verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And then I like that verse there to set the context for this lesson. Be at peace among yourselves. Very, very important. Be at peace among yourselves. And a lot of times there's churches to get on out to each other because elders will make a decision and some congregations won't like the decision they make and so dissension is sown and uh, such like. Uh, but be at peace among yourselves. And then when you get to verse 14, the emphasis shifts from elders to everybody. And Paul begins 
going into our text and explaining the text of this lesson today. Now we exhort you, brethren. And I think that probably, and it could be still talking about elders here, but I think that probably it doesn't refer to maybe all of us, in particular probably elders. And so, how should Christians live? How should Christians live? Francis Schaeffer, a long time ago, wrote a book, Then How We Should Live. And uh, I look at some excerpts of that book on the internet. I don't know where my copy is. I had a course on that at Fred Hardeman University taught by Brother Hollingsworth. And Brother Hollingsworth was a unique man. Uh, he was a very good, gifted teacher. Uh, this was a course that for some reason was offered at about 6.30 on Thursday evenings and I think it was required for graduation, and so I took it. But in Francis Schaeffer's book, he talks about worldviews, and he talks about the views that Christians have. And basically what Schaeffer was trying to do is to point out the fact these are basically worldviews. But then how should we meaning Christians, people that believe in God, people that believe in Christ and faith. And of course he wrote as Christians, quote unquote, worldwide, not necessarily members of the church, but Christians, followers of Jesus. How then shall we live? Well, you see, that is the question that we need to ask ourselves. How should Christians live before others? Think about that. How should we live before others? And in this lesson, we want to look at Paul's instructions to the church at Thessalonica. Paul, in writing this book, does like he does in a lot of his books. He gets to what is the last chapter in our Bible when Paul wrote it. Uh, it didn't have chapters. It didn't have verses. It more or less was one letter that you would read from the beginning and read to the end. Uh, the Masoretes were the ones that eventually would put chapters and verses in the Bible. But as it was originally written, if this was a letter and Paul says it was a letter, it was a letter that had a beginning. It was a letter that had the end. <laughs> and this would be, in a sense, the salutation, which really maybe begins a little later. But Paul, usually in our Bibles that we have now, in the last chapter of a particular book, will use a summation of a lot of things, and he'll throw a lot of things in this to surmise. And that's one reason that I believe that Paul probably wrote the book of Hebrews because if you look at the last chapter of the book of Hebrews, it's the same way as the last chapter of Ephesians is. It's the same way as the last chapter of Second Thess or First Thessalonians is. It is a summation of things. So that's what Paul's doing here. He's still on the topic of, you know, how we should react to elders and elders' responsibility to us and our responsibility to one another. But then he starts and he starts enumerating th little things here and there. Doesn't spend a lot of time on them. We won't spend a lot of time on them this morning, but we want to note them as we go. Because really, basically, Paul says, this is how you ought to live. This is how you ought to conduct yourselves. And I think it's very important. Number one, we need to realize that those in Christ should help and should seek to help fellow Christians remain faithful to the Lord. Remain faithful to the Lord. Look at verse 14 again. Now we exhort you, brethren, everybody. Now we exhort you. That would be who was with Paul at the time of his writing and Paul himself. Maybe also 
say by the power of the Holy Spirit that is, is instructing him by Jesus, but Paul said, we exhort you. Well, how do we get living faithful to the Lord out of this? Well, number one, as we will see, you warn or admonish those who are unruly or idle to repent. Now, I just noticed in the outline, I, and I don't think it's on another page. Nope, it's not on the other page. That, as we will see on the last point on this slide, the word unruly conveys the idea of those who are out of rank. Those that are not walking. And we'll come back to that. But notice, I didn't say anything about idle. I just now noticed that. Do we have idle Christians in the church? How would you describe an idle Christian? Well, the thought that just pops into my mind is an idle Christian may be the one that just comes to worship and does nothing else. You think about that. When I preached at DeSoto, we had a downstairs, and I know, I guess, for years, all the time we were down there, I remember when you went downstairs, if I remember correctly, there was a poster with a chicken on it. And the sign on that posting was this, sitting in a hen house will not make you a chicken, just like being in church won't make you a Christian. <laughs> good saying, isn't it? I mean, you can go sit in somebody's hen house and we got people with hen houses. Christian Patty's got chickens or Mikey's Chris got chickens. Patty told me that the other day. And by the way, we're missing Patty too. But but Patty told me the other night, no, that's, that's Chris and Mikey's farm. And But they got a little bit of everything. And they, and they probably have a chicken house or we'll get a chicken house because that's where chickens go. And Johnny and them's got a chicken house, and the people's got chicken houses. You can go in there and sit all along, but you're still not going to be a chicken. And you can come checking this church building all day long, seven days out of the week, or you can sit three, three hours out of the week. But if you're not living the Christian life actively, you're not really a Christian, are you? You're not faithful. You can be unfaithful and still come three times a week. And I think I want to stress that. Well, that's being idle. you got to work. You got to be active in the kingdom of the Lord. Well, what is our duty toward those, especially elders, in this uh, idea? Then they are to exhort, and we are to exhort, because he said, brethren, we are to exhort. You know what exhort means? It's up there on the screen. It conveys the are pleading with someone to pursue a particular course. You ever been to a doctor that exhorted you? Mine usually goes something like this. You need to cut back on the food. I found a good way to keep that from happening is go to a fat doctor. <laughs> I don't know if it works or not, but I've noticed that. <laughs> and sometimes I'll say, you need to be, get out and get more exercise. Anybody ever been told that? <laughs> that's exhorting. What they're doing is saying, pursue this course. Well, that's what we need to do. Is the elders need to exhort congregations, and we really need to exhort the elders in a good way, but we also need to exhort one another. Saying, look, let's keep on living for the Lord. Let's keep doing what Jesus wanted to do. Pursue that course. Well, now let's talk about unruly just a minute. It was a military term. And so when these people that Paul was writing to in the first century heard that idea, uh, remember that he spoke uh, Konea uh, Greek to, the, to them, and that was the really the worldwide known language at that time, and that's 
I believe one of the reasons that God picked that time for the church to come into existence. They had a common language. Unlike the Hebrew language, which was not common. It was to the Jews, and mostly people that were of Jewish descent spoke that. But when you come to the time of Christ, you had a language, Greek, that nearly all the known world uh, would convey in and speak, much like English is today. And I believe that when Paul used that word unruly, they knew exactly what he was meaning. They, they probably pictured a soldier that if he was unruly, he broke rank. Now, a lot of times when you break rank, you're usually, especially in time of war, you're sometimes shot on sight. <laughs> If you're in basic and you break rank, they try to teach you <laughs> what it means to stay in rank. And they might drum you out if you don't stay in rank. And if you're in the military, they might bust you down a couple of stripes. Or if it's something that is greater, they might give you an honorable discharge. And so the idea, well, let's move on. Those in Christ should comfort the faint-hearted, and support or uphold the weak. Again, the word exhort conveys the idea of pleading with someone to pursue a particular course. The idea of comfort the faint-hearted. Notice it didn't say comfort the bereaved. We do a good job of that, or we, we should do a good job of that. Someone loses a loved one like the Platt family. I'm going to go over to Corning as a friend, as a brother in Christ, and as the minister that uh, chose me to officiate at Betty's funeral. And I'm going to try to comfort that family in all those things. I have an obligation as a Christian to do it. I have an obligation, I believe, as a minister of the gospel to comfort that family. But here it's not talking about comforting the bereaved. Have you noticed that? Comfort the faint-hearted. Well, when, when, when you see somebody in physical life and they're faint-hearted, what does that mean? Well, it means maybe they faint real easy. Maybe they can't exert themselves a whole lot because they're faint-hearted. I believe in the spiritual sense, it's talking maybe about those Christians that maybe because of weakness, maybe because of their age in the Lord, maybe they're still babes in Christ, and rightfully so because they are new converts, or maybe they have not grown and reached the spiritual maturity that they need and sometimes they're weak. They might be spiritually mature and yet still struggle. We all do that. The things of life get us down. Well, what are we to do? We are to the idea to give encouragement for them to remain strong. The word translated, believe it's in King James support. New King James says, uphold the weak. Conveys the idea of holding on to someone firmly are giving attention to someone. I think it's easy sometimes in life, and it's easy to do in the church, whether you're Christian, preacher, or elder, to sometimes get fed up with those that are weak because 
of their in, uh, uh, their uh, not growing. They don't have uh, now if they don't have the ability to grow, that's one thing. But you're taking to someone and they struggle. And sometimes in my uh, working as a minister, years of being a Christian and dealing with people, there are certain people in congregations that you always have to keep an eye on. A lot of times we can be hard-hearted and say, oh, they're always going to be that way. Sometimes we can say they all, they've always been that way. And we let them be. But what's the case here? Word translate, it's a poe, conveys the idea of holding on to someone firmly or giving attention to someone. We've got some here that uh, they can't get around as good as they used to. And I've noticed a lot of times, Dwayne and Paul is an example. Paul has to hold on to Dwayne. No, it's the other way around, but it may be her keeping him in line too with that walker. But I noticed how he helps her. We'll go down here uh, down to El Palenque's after here I am talking about food and preaching, but we'll go down here to El Palenque's after lunch and she'll make her way up the stairs, but he's always right behind her. Always right behind her. Helping her. Holding her up. Upholding her. Folks, when it comes to Christian people, we need to encourage one another. Even those that are weak. Because that's the import of this verse. And then the next point. Those in Christ should be mindful of the life they live before others by being patient with all especially one another. Well, did we get that? Let's look at the text again. He said, be patient with all. I think that kind of goes beyond the church. It's hard to be patient with some people, isn't it? go to a store and, and I know a lot of people gripe about having to check themselves out and this and that. The only one I, that ever gets impatient with me when I do that is, is Inez. And I try not to, to mess up a whole lot. I have messed up. And, and by the way, I was raised working in the grocery store. I was worked at Fred's Dollar Store. I've checked people out all my life. Doesn't bother me at all to check myself out, but some of you might, okay? Just don't grumble and complain about it. Go somewhere where they'll check you out if you're not happy where you shop. But, but the idea is that we need to realize you go to the store sometime and you, you use a checker. You'll have a sacker. And I mean, I had a couple of uh, uh, girls sacking at a grocery store and it's not out here at Hearts, but down, down in Baseful, it's Kroger where it was. Kroger's been good to me. They took care of my dad for 30-something years plus. But I had a couple of girls there sacking our groceries. That's one of the few places you'll have maybe that has actually a sacker. And they were sacking my groceries. I don't think either one of them said hi to either me or I as it one. They kept sacking and kept yakking. They were yakking about a movie. I don't, can't remember what it was. I can tell you. But they were yakking, and they were yakking about this, and yakking back, and one was over there, one was there. Well, when I worked in the retail world, you didn't do that. Oh, he would have gotten in trouble. But the idea was, I didn't scold them for that. I didn't really get upset about it, because this way, be patient. Be patient. 
Be patient with the brethren that irritate you. Are there some out there? Well, they are everywhere, but be patient. Hang in there with them. Be patient with all men. Strive, be long-suffering. It carries this idea, especially to one another. Moving on, not returning evil for evil in verse 15, but pursuing what is good. And this is taught in the Bible, as we'll see in a minute, but let's look at the text. Not returning evil for evil. Remember what Jesus said the Jews taught? What did they teach? An eye for an eye. You poke my eye out, I want to poke your eye out. And they also practiced it uh, under the Mosaic Law. And then you had uh, countries that practiced that, maybe some to this day. An elder brother gets killed in the family by a member of the uh, other family. A lot of times the elder brother in that family is going to get killed. What? An eye for an eye. Paul says, not returning evil for evil. Well, what did Jesus teach and do? Well, what He taught. If you look at the screen or open your Bibles in Matthew 5, verses 44 through 45, He taught the Sermon on the Mount where He's talking about what used to be and what now is. A lot of people didn't like that, but what He was contrasted is the old Mosaical Law was being done away with, and He said it won't be done away with until ever jot or ever tittle the biggest letter in the little letter of the Mosaical Law is fulfilled. He's fulfilling it, fulfilled it on the cross, and it was taken out of the way on the cross. But He's telling them what was is no longer. This is what is. You go to the last part of the Sermon on the Mount, and the people were astonished that He spoke of one who had authority not as the scribe. And so Jesus with authority said in Matthew 5, 44, But I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. We'll talk more about that on Wednesday night when we study love. If you were not coming on Wednesday night class, you need to come. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Our Lord is saying the old way eye for an eye the old way, do unto them before they do unto you. That's how a lot of people look at the golden rule. <laughs> the old way, if he hits you, you you'd hit him. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. The old way is now different. Well, why? Verse 45. Why? Conclusion. That you may be sons of your fathers in heaven. And then he told why. We, we quote this verse in and I just noticed, you know, I learned some things when I get these lessons together, and it just struck out to me again, because I'm a believer in context. You don't ask me, just ask my sister. We went over to see her yesterday, and Inez said I preached half the time we were eating, and I guess I did. That's why I'm warmed up for today. So. <laughs> and 
But look at the context. We always quote this part, but look at the context. Go back. Everything that he says is based on two premises. Number one, verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Well, what does God do? He makes His Son, S-U-N, to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain upon the just and the unjust. Well, what is the teaching there? What's Jesus saying? This is what He's saying. He's already said it. Go back to verse 44. You don't treat people the way they treat you. You be good to people even though they're not good to you. Why? You're sons of God. Well, what does God do? <laughs> he blesses both those that are righteous and those who are not. He does good both to the righteous and to the unrighteous. He sends the rain on the what? The just and the unjust. Is it becoming clearer now how this verse fits in the context of our study? Be different. Well, did Jesus ever practice that? You know, a lot of times you have preachers don't practice what they preach. I try to, but I may not always. I'll be honest with you. Well, did Jesus practice what He preached? goes over to Peter here. In 1 Peter, the second chapter in verse 23. We've already read this in our class, but read it again. Who, talking about Jesus, when He was reviled, did not revile in return. Well, preacher, you don't know what they said about me. I know what they said about Him. You claim to be the Son of God, you prophesy who struck you. If you claim to be the Son of God, you pray that the angels come down and take you off the cross. What did Jesus say? Nothing. They accused Him of a lot of things. And most of the time He was silent. He did reply one time, Thou sayest. Did He practice what He preached? You better believe it. When He was reviled, He did not revile in return. Oh, they just told me what far, and I'm going to give them what far. It's better off sometimes just to keep your mouth shut and turn around. And that's why the proverb writer said, sometimes a soft answer turns away wrath. <laughs> you ever wish sometimes you'd kept your mouth shut? It's kind of like I said Wednesday night, even about things that we post, that when you post something out there on the Internet, you can never get it back. It's out there forever. And there's people that are paid to dig up all the dirt they can come on an organization or upon individuals, and that's what they get paid for, is to look for those things that you post on the Internet where if they can ever use it against you, they may say, here it is right here. Amen? I can't stress that enough. Be careful. Remember who you are. And more than that, remember whose you are. When he suffered, he did not threaten. You better not hit me because if you do, I'm going to lay you out. I mean, he could have said, well, if you want to see 10,000 angels or a league of angels, why don't I call all of heaven's hosts down here? <laughs> then let's see what you're doing. A am I getting through? Do you understand what's going on here? But he committed himself to him who judges 
righteousness. All of us would like our day in court, quote unquote. I mean, wouldn't we? We'd all like a day in court whether we, we could prove our case. We all would like our day in court where we could say, look, the things they're saying against me are wrong. Now, sometimes there's cases for libel and slander that we go to court. And if you said something that's libelous or slander to somebody, you can go to court, you can get on a witness stand, and you can say, well, I didn't really mean it, but it's not going to do a lot of good because why? You said it <laughs> in some form. Or another. How did Jesus react the way he did? Because he committed himself to him who judges righteously. I believe in that case he submitted himself to God. And I believe in our case, because God Jesus is going to be our judge, we commit ourselves both to God and Jesus themselves. And for that matter, the Holy Spirit. Well, let's move on. Christians could seek, should seek what is the common good for all those concerned. Doesn't matter if they go to church here. Doesn't matter sometimes their circumstances in life. Doesn't matter how they treat you. Folks, people in this world, especially in our country, need to realize number one, those saying is there, but by the grace of God go I. We get upset at the homeless. Maybe it's God's grace that we're not out there with. Them. We get upset with the beggars that are becoming more and more part of our society wherever you go. There by the grace of God go I. But for the grace of God go I. You see, we're all human beings. Doesn't matter what color we are. Doesn't matter what language we speak. Doesn't matter where we were born or on what side of the tracks we were born on. The way I read my Bible, it says that we're all created in God's image and we're all of one blood. Amen? Folks, watch what you say about other races. Watch the name you call other races even though you've used it all your life. Because you were raised in the South. I heard a deal not too long about diversity ago and and the lady is a lady presenting, a lady of, that was African American was presenting, and she didn't talk about that, but she talked about being a lady. And one of them that was helping was short. And she said, you know, short people don't necessarily like short, short people jokes. Well, for that matter, fat people don't necessarily like fat people jokes. I've been one, I am one, and I can tell you. Blonde women, they say, don't necessarily like blonde jokes. And I'm not talking about being politically correct. I'm ta talking about being biblically correct. I don't care what people in the world say. I care about what God says. And we need to have a good for all concerned. Well, let's move on. Those in Christ should remember to rejoice always. I mean, that's a hard thing. Do we rejoice when uh, someone dies? Well, if they're a Christian, we can rejoice always. We can rejoice on how I'm going to do with 
Betty Arnold's family that she's waiting in paradise. Some say she's waiting in heaven. I don't have a problem with either one because I think I understand what the text says. Rejoice always. Good times, bad times. Move it on. Pray without ceasing. We all know what that means, but what does it mean? It means not that we have to go around all the time praying. That's what some people think. How many of us do that? None of us. I pray going down the highway, just I don't close my eyes. I hope you pray going down the highway sometime, and I hope you don't close your eyes, okay? <laughs> what it means, be always in a constant readiness of prayer. Someone asks you, will you pray for me? You'll say, yes, I can. Why? Because you're actively praying to God all the time. Pray without ceasing. Giving thanks to God for everything, for this is God's will. Well, does it say that? Look at the verse. In everything, give thanks. Well, Lord, how, how can I give thanks that I've got this disease? We, we kind of went through that when... Inez was diagnosed with breast cancer. How can I give thanks to God that she has breast cancer? Well, I gave thanks to God in other ways. Number one, I gave thanks to God that He was God. Number two, I gave thanks that Inez was a godly woman and a Christian. Now, number three, as time went on, I thank God for the good oncologists that we've got down in or she's got down in Searcy, Arkansas. I thank God for the good surgery that I read, uh, the surgeon that I read about and that Sheila recommended down in Little Rock, Arkansas, that did her surgery. A kind, compassionate lady doctor who could relate to Inez in a way that I could not relate. I'm thankful for the foundation that paid for literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of treatment that we did not have money to pay for. I'm thankful for the good recovery she's had almost three years out. And everything give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God. I can think of all the times that I went through things in my life. My parents. I went through. My mom, she was a Christian wife and a Christian mother. She stayed by my dad. And she never did leave. Where I can remember the first time she didn't stay at the hospital all night. And that was when he was suffering with dementia and Alzheimer's and we had to put him in the hospital to transition to a nursing home. And she let me stay. You see, there are a lot of things we go through that we wonder, what in the world can we be thankful about? That's why I'm Paul and Philippians 4 said, you know, don't be anxious about nothing, but with everything, with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving. Okay, let's move along. This is God's will. Luke 18, verse 1, Then He spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. Ingratitude grieves a giving God. 
And then, those in Christ should remember not to quench the Spirit or despise the teaching of God's Word, but carefully study and test the things that were taught. We don't know sometimes what it, the Holy Spirit does. We don't understand everything that we does, but we do know that one of the things that it did was to give us the inspired Word of God. We don't know what He does in our own life. I don't. And I believe that He works in my life in ways I don't understand because I think that's what the book teaches. How does He intercede for me with groanings that cannot be uttered? How does He seal me with the earnest of the inheritance? But the Bible says He does it. Quench not the Spirit. And we need to seek ourselves to yield ourselves to God's will. We should never despise the Holy Word of God. I don't have time to talk about how that is done in our brotherhood and in the religious world today. I will say this. You tell some people what the Bible teaches even that profess to be members of the Lord's body, and they're going to tell you, I don't care what it teaches. This is what I'm going to do. That's despising the Word of the Lord. Finally, those in Christ should remember abstain from every appearance of evil. We need to have a, have a lesson on that. Is, is, is something not evil... Our good, maybe it's out there. What should we do? Abstain from every appearance of evil. We need to talk about that more and we don't have time. Consider these verses. Hebrews 5.14 But solid food belongs to those who are full of That is, those who by reason you or you reason of you use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, there may be some things that a new Christian will protect of. Because they're not full grown yet. doesn't make them bad. It just makes them not full grown yet. But now they start practicing. They, by reason of using what God has teach, their senses are exercised to discern both good and evil. Should I do this? And lesson on that. Romans 12 and verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite. We'll talk more of that on Wednesday night. Abhor what is evil and cleave to that which is good. And this is the last thing I'll say. What kind of life are you living before those around you? If you need to respond, the lesson is
watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come. Have we been true to the trust He left us? Do we seem to do our best? If in our hearts there is God condemns us, we shall have a glorious rest. Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for a soul's ride home? Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come? Blessed are those when the Lord finds watching, in his glory they shall share. If he shall come as the dawn or midnight, will he find us watching there? Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come.